So uh, uh, before we get into the technical uh, stuff for the class, I wanted to remind everyone that there's a homework that's due today, uh, homework four. Uh, it covers learning theory. Um, if you haven't started, uh, please do start. Um, of course, you uh, the usual policy, so, uh, the usual late policy also is available. And uh, the other big announcement is that there won't be any class on Tuesday. Uh, there will be an announcement about this uh, on Canvas in case uh, you missed the class today. Um, there won't be a class on Tuesday, and uh, I've decided to move the homeworks uh, the schedule a little bit so that you actually get a weekend off. So there won't be any homework. Uh, homework five, just to answer a question that came uh, the discussion in the chat. Homework five is going to be uh, available later, not not during this weekend, so that you actually get a breather. Um, are there any questions? Yes, there is one. Um, so there's the. Um, so uh, I don't understand the premise of uh, question two. How are we supposed to be using the templates um, uh, to shatter XN? Are we checking if any one template can match all XN? So the templates are just functions. So if you have a template, let me give let me uh, just walk through an example. So let's say we have uh, uh, n equals three, like it's uh, described in the homework. And uh, um, let's say you have uh, xn consists of uh, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. And uh, let's say that uh, just uh, let's say we are considering a template that looks like, say, dash 0 dash. Now, this template is a function that, uh, is, so the way it is defined. Uh, this template is uh, going to label this point as a positive, positive, negative, negative. I think I missed something here. Positive, positive, negative, and negative. Because it needs to, it's looking for the zero in the middle and anything in the place of the dashes. So, um, it's called a template in the homework, but uh, think of it as a function. So what you have is a set of functions. And for any set of functions, you can always ask a question about shattering. Uh, which reminds me, I promise that I will record. Yes, I am recording. Um, uh, so now that you have a set of functions and a set of points, you can apply uh, the definition of uh, shattering. For example, you have Something like uh, if you know the, the set of functions includes all possible uh, templates. So H three is uh, a template that is just one one one, one one dash one one zero, one zero one, one zero dash one zero. And you know I'm not going to write all uh, twenty seven things, but uh, Things like this, it'll include the, the thing that we considered and so on. So for instance, uh, now you have a set of functions and you have a set of points. So we can apply the definition of shattering here. So um, in order to kind of work this out, uh, what you need to do is for every, so what's the definition of shattering? A set of functions shatters a set of points if for every way in which you can label this thing. So you imagine that you have a, a labeling. For every way in which you can label the points, there is some template. In this case, for this labeling, this template matches it. So this set S3 shatters uh, this thing. So um, where for every way in which you can label the points, um, you, um, you can find a representative in the set of functions. So uh, the, the question is asking whether uh, HN in general, not H3, but HN can shatter XN. This is a set of functions and this is a set of points. Um, and uh, the way to think about it is uh, uh, either if, if you believe that it does, then you need to show how, no matter how someone picks a certain labeling, you can find a representative in H3. And that will agree with it. If you want to show that's not possible, you can come up with 
for any xn, any set of points, any dimensionality, uh, where for any n actually, uh, you can find a certain labeling for which no uh, function in S3 exists. So you need to show how to, uh, in, the, in the latter case, if you're saying that this does not shadow, you need to construct a certain labeling, a way of assigning labels to all the points. And then you need to show, when I say show, you need to argue, prove that uh, there's nothing in X, S3 that contains it. So the one, the one side of the proof, uh, if you're saying that it does shatter, requires you to uh, imagine an arbitrary labeling and show that there's a function that matches it. Otherwise, you need to produce a particular labeling for which no function exists. I hope that uh, answers the question. So are there any recommendations for feature pre-processing and data wrangling? In fact, there is an entire class on this, uh, on data wrangling. Um, I think it's called a DS2500 or something like that. Um, let me see. I, I don't remember the uh, the class number. It's an undergraduate class that is offered as part of the data science degree. Um, it was offered, I think, last in spring, and I that's pretty much all I can find right now. I don't uh, I have I don't have the uh, next spring sch uh, schedule in front of me, uh, but it's going to be a class that is uh, a regular offering. So it talks about how to you know get data from different sources, how to clean it up and such things. So uh, the, the, that would be my recommendation. Um, so when will homework five be released? Definitely not in the weekend, um, uh, probably uh, a, a, probably next Thursday. I just want to give a free week for you because I imagine that uh, uh, when I say free, I mean in terms of homework because I imagine that many of you have many, many things going on. Um, and uh, uh, Yes, I, it looks like at least one of you appreciates that. So will we be able to finish all seven homeworks by the end of the year? That's the hope. Um, the, 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 it's going to be six or seven homeworks. I'm most likely, I'm, I'm planning on six. Um, so for question four, uh, can the if conditions be repeated? So if you have, so let me write this down because uh, so can the if conditions be repeated? Can we have C1 equals X1 and C2 is X2 and X3 and C3 is X1? So in theory you can, but you don't need to because once you have checked, so let's uh, think about it this way, okay? Um, so if you, instead of, I'm, I, I'm gonna write it as a tree. So if you have something like this and uh, you check for X1, one and then, now once you've checked for X1 and it says no, there's no reason to check for X1 again. Because if it, it's going to be no again. It's not like as you go down the tree, the value of X1 changes. So you could repeat it, but there's no need to. Um, and in fact, you can assume that there are no repetition because repetitions are just redundancies. Okay, um, are there any other questions? If not, um, let's get going with the lecture for today. Today's lecture is uh, going to wrap up our segment on SVMs. Um, oh, there's a, can we consider it to be an upper bound? You could, uh, if you're doing the pack learnability uh, counting. Yeah, for, uh, you can consider it to be, an, oh, right. Okay, I, I see your, uh, the, I see the connection to the question now, Sveda, uh, Sevda. I'm sorry if I'm uh, mispronouncing your name. Um, so yeah, yeah, uh, for counting, you can definitely consider it to be an upper bound provided you can show that uh, the upper bound is polynomial. If the upper bound is polynomial, then uh, uh, the actual count will also be less than polynomial or polynomial. So yes, you're right. Yeah, for counting, you might, uh, you can make your life easier. I was thinking for, uh, um, in general for decision lists, yes, okay. All right, um, so let's uh, get going with the lecture for today. Uh, today we're gonna to wrap up 
the section on uh, support vector machines. Uh, and we'll talk about training with stochastic gradient descent. Now, today, we, the, the thing is, we're going to get into a little bit of detail about stochastic gradient descent. And uh, this is going to give us like a general template of a learning algorithm, not just for support vector machines, but also beyond. In fact, it's going to give us a scaffolding that if you change uh, some things, you will get logistic regression. If you change something else, you can get like arbitrary neural networks. So even though it's introduced under this umbrella of uh, support vector machines, we are going to talk about a general uh, um, aspect of learning uh, using this optimization algorithm, stochastic gradient descent. So just to uh, kind of set the context of where we are, uh, we already looked at the SVM objective function. That's what we saw in the last lecture. Uh, and we went into it in quite a bit of detail. So I'm not going to uh, uh, spend any uh, more time on it unless you have a question or two. Uh, but uh, so we, we saw this objective function. The objective function consists of two parts. It consists of the first term here is called the regularizer or it's called the regularization term. What it does is it says, among all functions that are equally good, here's a preference. In, in, since we are minimizing, remember, we are minimizing this objective function with respect to W. So what the regularizer is saying is among all functions, among all weight vectors in this case, that are equally good according to some other criterion, I prefer the one that has a lower value of W transpose W. So it imposes a preference over the hypothesis space that's not really dependent on any data. And it comes from some sort of a intuitive argument or a formal argument about the nature of concepts. The uh, reason for one reason, there are actually, we will encounter multiple reasons for using this exact regularizer. One reason for using this regularizer is to say that uh, you would like to maximize the margin. And we've uh, gone through this argument a few times, uh, this, uh, this uh, argument about why these two things are equivalent a few times. Um, and then the, this is just one of many possible regularizers. But this is not the only term in the optimization. So really the minimization is over the sum of these two things. So the second term in this optimization encourages a lower empirical loss. So it, this specific function that we have here is called the hinge loss. And uh, it penalizes weight vectors for mistakes that they make. Um, so if the... Uh, the, the, remember, there are three regions here, right? The, if a weight vector does not make a mistake, so y times w transpose x is uh, greater than zero, and in fact, it's greater than one, then there's no penalty. If y w transpose x, so this is the uh, uh, thing to consider. We have this quantity, we have three regions here. We have greater than one, between zero and one, and then less than zero. So. If I write it in a cleaner way, so you have this thing. You have a zero here, you have a one. This is one region, this is another region, and this is a third region. And in each case, we have some penalties. Here we have a zero penalty, and uh, here we have one minus y w transpose x, and in fact, we have the same thing here also. So uh, this is the empirical loss. So the first term in this objective says, uh, in the absence of any data, here's a preference over hypothesis. The second term says, um, let me try to uh, fit or overfit even the data set. If the second term is zero, you have a separable case. You have separable data. If the first term is zero, that means you have a infinite margin. Uh, both of these things could be bad because if, uh, the, uh, if you focus too heavily on this term, you get a really large margin but you might end up throwing away examples to achieve that large margin. And if you focus too much on the second term, you might end up overfitting the data and possibly even the noise. So we need to control between these two things. And that's why we have this hyperparameter that controls the trade-off. Here I've written it as C. Um, the one thing to note is that in some books or some uh, papers, you might see that the C actually is not attached there. It's uh, called a lambda and it sits on, sits, it's, it's, it's multiplied with the weights. So you get something like lambda times W transpose W plus hinge loss. Um, 
basically they are the same thing. I mean, you can think of C is equal to one minus lambda in this case. So these are all equivalent. So this is the objective function. Now the goal of learning is to find the weight vector given a certain C, we have to, uh, how do you know which C is good? It's by uh, cross validation. Given a certain C, the goal of learning is to find that weight vector that has the lowest value uh, of this entire function. So once again, we are thinking of learning as such. But uh, instead of thinking of it as such, remember W um, is a real vector or RD. Um, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it, it's a hyperplane, it defines a hyperplane. We have the luxury of playing with real numbers here. So we can frame this as an optimization problem. So that's what we're going to do. So we're going to train uh, SVMs by uh, gradient driven optimization. This is the plan for today. First, I'm going to uh, do a brief, very kind of a hand wavy overview of convex functions and uh, gradient descent. And we will look at uh, uh, gradient descent once again. Uh, we've already seen it once with uh, least mean squares. And we'll see, uh, again, we'll see stochastic gradient descent. And I'll show an example of, of what, how these two things operate in the objective space, and then talk about how for the hinge loss, how do we take the gradient? And that will, once you are able to take the gradient, you'll, you can plug it into the gradient descent algorithm, and that completes the stochastic subgradient descent algorithm for SVM. And it turns out once we go through all of this process, we will get an algorithm that looks remarkably like perceptron. So we will just put them side by side to see what's going on. So um, uh, there, there, before we go on, let's see if there are questions. There is min, okay, so let me just uh, erase all of this here. So the, is min over all the terms? Yes, the so min is over all terms. So you have a bracket here. The penalty, for example, for having a wrong prediction is, uh, penal is much higher than the penalty, for example, breaking the margin. This is absolutely right. If you plot the penalty as a function of uh, 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 y w transpose x, it would look something like this. So you have y w transpose x. At one, on this side, you have a zero penalty here, and then the penalty keeps growing. This is this blue line here is exactly this function here. So uh, the penalty for breaking the margin is just this much. And as you keep going on the wrong side, you keep increasing the, uh, the, the hinge loss. So this is exactly the hinge loss. All right, so let's, uh, uh, let's step into this uh, thing about learning by optimization uh, by talking about convex functions. So the reason we are talking about convex functions is that this objective function that we have, uh, this SVM objective function is convex in W. What does convex mean uh, and why is that a good property? Um, some of you may have seen convexity before, some of you may not. Uh, so uh, if you haven't, here's a formal definition. If you have, here's, uh, uh, you, here's a way to uh, recollect it. So a function is convex if for every, uh, let's say we have a function f, it's convex if for every u and v in the domain and for any lambda that's a, a number between zero and one, we have this property. F of lambda u plus one minus lambda v is less than lambda times f of u plus one minus lambda times f of v. Now this is a rather, um, this is just a definition, but let's kind of unravel this definition and look at what it really means. So suppose you have a point here that's, u and a point here v. When I pick a lambda between zero and one, uh, what we are doing is, uh, let's say we have a lambda that's uh, some value here. We, what we're doing is we're really constructing a point in between. So let me zoom in a bit so that we can. So what we'd have here, let's say this quantity is lambda and this quantity here is one minus lambda. So this point, in the middle is lambda times u plus one minus lambda times times v. That's exactly this point here. Now, we, the, the, the left-hand side of this inequality is saying, what's the value of the function at that point? So that we can go here. This is the value of the function at that point. 
inequality says this is less than lambda times f of u plus one minus lambda times f of v. f of u is the value of the function at u and f of v is here. Lam anytime you have lambda something x plus one minus lambda y, we are looking at a point in between provided lambda is between zero and one. So this point here, f lambda times f of u times plus one minus lambda f of v corresponds to this thing here. So this is here. So this is lambda and this is one minus lambda. So you have the interpolation of the function values. So what this inequality is really saying is for any u and v that we pick, if you find a point in between, it's not just this point, if you find a point in between, the value of the function lies below the line that connects, um, uh, the, 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 the basically below the chord, if uh, you remember what chords are. Uh, below these two things, uh, the, the, the line that joins these two points. And this is true for any u and v and for any lambda. It's just a property of the function. Now, if, if this is true for every u and v in the domain, then what we end up having is a function that don't, does not have anything that goes like this, any uh, shape like that. So, um, or even any undulations like this, which is a nice uh, thing to have and we'll see and as uh, Ashton points out, it tells us that we, we, we guarantee to have a minima. Another way of uh, defining convex functions is uh, from the geometric perspective. Um, and the, we will actually end up using this uh, intuition uh, when we uh, derive the gradient of the SVM objective. Every tangent plane lies below the function. So the tangent, in this case, it's a tangent line. The tangent line never intersects the function. Um, uh, so you don't get anything like this, where you have this intersection, the tangent plane is always just below. This is another, uh, uh, this is just an intuitive uh, definition. Uh, there are many, many convex functions. Um, so linear functions are convex, quadratic functions, f of x is x squared is convex. And for the purposes of uh, this lecture, we will exploit the fact that max of uh, x and y is a convex function, max of zero comma x in particular is a convex function. Uh, convex, this is of course not true just for functions in one dimension. You can have a function in two dimensions, f of, f of uh, um, uh, x1 and x2 is defined in this way. It's like this parabola, parab paraboloid if you want. And uh, that's also a convex function. Uh, one of the kind of, uh, interesting things to think about is how do you show that a function is convex or not? Uh, there are multiple ways of doing that. One of them is to just work through the definition of this convex, con of convexity and uh, you know see if that property holds for the function. For uh, functions in, uh, for, for functions with one dimensional inputs, like the thing, all the three things on top, you can take the second derivative and show that it's uh, positive or at least non-negative. Um, for functions in multiple dimensions, like the one that we have, uh, you, you need to show that the second derivative is a positive semi-definite matrix. Um, if uh, you really don't want to think about that, just take it as a given that the same objective is convex. It's kind of fun to prove that it is. Um, how do you get the tangent plane for max? We'll talk about that uh, when we get there. Not every function, of course, is convex. So we have, concave functions where the direction of the inequality is changed. And we have in functions that are neither convex nor concave. So uh, it just so happens that the function that we have at hand for SVM is a convex function. So the, the reason it's a useful uh, thing to think about, convex functions are extremely convenient because in general, um, I'm sure you remember from your calculus classes that for a point x to be the minimum value of a function f, you need the gradient to be zero at that point. For convex functions, this is both necessary and sufficient. So all you need to do is find that one point or find a point that has a, a minimum, uh, that has the gradient zero, and you're guaranteed that the, that point is the uh, minimum value of the function. So, uh, this sets up a nice uh, uh, search problem. What we end up doing is uh, our goal is to find a point that has zero gradient. More generally, uh, convex functions come with guarantees. 
convex functions come with uh, guarantees like uh, uh, if you, you you can find the global minimum in theory uh, it comes with a guarantee that gradient based optimization is going to take you to the minimum and so on so uh, uh, ashton uh, has a, a noticed something very interesting i have linear functions that are in the concave examples and also in the convex examples linear functions are the only functions that are both convex and concave um, and uh, that's because the linear function is its own tangent the line is a tangent to itself and at no point does the uh, this is this inequality by the way you can think of it that way this inequality is a strict equality for uh, linear functions and uh, it works both directions so um, linear functions are both convex and concave uh, what if the minimum lies uh, uh, on the corner that can't be differentiated we are going to assume we don't have the problem because uh, we have uh, uh, we are optimizing over the entire real space uh, thankfully we don't have linear functions also because remember the objective we are trying to optimize is this thing here which is clearly quadratic in the w so we don't have to worry about uh, uh, that also okay so uh, the objective function that we have is a quadratic optimization problem because the objective uh, the there is a quadratic term uh, in the objective and uh, uh, I, as i mentioned maybe a lecture or two ago quadratic programming is really the study of optimizing functions that have quadratic objectives there are well studied methods for this um, and if this was uh, uh, you know if this optimization problem that we are looking at the fpm optimization problem does not have the special form that we will take advantage of very soon we could have just given up and said okay we're going to use the standard methods for qp quadratic programming and leave it to that turns out it's going to be very slow but that's the best we can do the good news is one good news is that this particular uh, optimization problem is just unconstrained we are minimizing over all possible w there are no constraints on the w other than the fact that we want to find the minimum the, it, there are no constraints that say w should be should have these other properties also so we can use gradient descent but it turns out it's going to be still slow so let me uh, remind you the uh, the strategy for gradient descent gradient descent is a general strategy for minimizing any function let's say we have a function j of w j is an objective function that assigns a certain value for every point uh, for every weight vector you can start with some initial guess w0 so it could be this point here and then you compute the gradient what's the meaning of the gradient the gradient is uh, uh, is a is the direction in which the function grows the fastest so at this point the function is growing the fastest in this direction and it's not growing in any other direction we have only one more direction which is the other one so uh, the the mental image that's often evoked for gradient descent is we're trying to get to the bottom of a valley and uh, we are standing at a point and imagine that we are in a point where it's completely foggy uh, the whole valley is uh, foggy so we can't really see far away all we can do is standing where we are we can just feel around and ask is the hill going up in this direction or not and you find the direction in which it's going up the fastest the steepest direction and you take a step in the opposite direction so the gradient is the direction in which the function is increasing the fastest and you take a step in the opposite direction so you go from uh, something like w0 to w1 w1 to w2 w2 to w3 and you and so on so you keep doing this till you are convinced that uh, we have uh, reached reached the minimum or uh, in practice till you are convinced that we have come close enough to the minimum that uh, it's not going to matter any more steps are not going to matter this is the intuition for gradient descent so at every point so it's an iterative process so uh, given a function uh, the function the specific function we care about is the svm objective so given uh, this function here uh, we compute the gradient uh, we first of all we start off with some initial guess w0 
And then at each step, we compute the gradient of the function at WP and we call it nabla the j. Uh, that's just the, uh, the, the notation for the gradient. And I see that I have a p plus one here. So this should be nabla j of w t. Um, and then you just uh, take a step in the opposite direction. That's why you have a negative thing. Um, R here is the learning rate, or actually it's the size of the step that you take. You can either take a giant step or you can just take tiny steps. Now, this is a general gradient descent. The problem with gradient uh, descent, ah, okay, so there's a question. Is the stopping uh, condition a particular value when the gradient is close enough to zero? Um, there are a few different ways of stopping actually. One of those is what you just described when the gradient is close enough to zero. Another one is uh, you can keep, every time you take a step, you can compute the value of j, j of w t. You can keep track of this and you can stop when j of w t minus j of w t plus one is uh, small enough. If, this, if the, uh, the change in the function is so small, um, let's say, let's put an absolute value here for good measure is less than some epsilon. It's, it, if the change in the function is close enough to zero, which is essentially very similar to what you just described. The thing is the gradient being closer to zero is a, a slightly more complicated thing because it's a vector. So you need to take the length of that vector. Um, a much better test is to actually just uh, take the function value and see if the change in the function value is close to zero or is less than epsilon. Um, Another way of stopping is to say, uh, we um, just run it for a certain number of iterations because that's how much time we have and hope for the best. We'll see a few other approaches. We can use a validation set that we keep measuring the, uh, the function value on um, to stop or even better, we can use a validation set. Remember the goal of learning is um, uh, generalization. It's performance on held out data. So you can have a special data set, special slice of the data set that you keep measuring accuracy on or some sort of performance, you know, that is not the loss, but something else. And you stop when the accuracy doesn't improve anymore or you stop when accuracy starts getting worse. So there are a few different approaches. Um, so the, uh, just to kind of uh, take a uh, look at the chat, uh, the gradient's a vector, so it's, uh, you, I mean, a vector also can equal zero, but you can just look at the length of the vector. Yes, the gradient is a vector. That's an important uh, observation. So there are two hyperparameters now, C and R. Um, yes, uh, it turns out R is a little bit more complicated and it can spawn its own many, many hyperparameters. And we'll talk about that briefly as, in a bit. Uh, let's now, uh, so, uh, okay. So th the stochastic gradient descent Ah, okay, so that's a good segue. So there's a question about stochastic gradient descent. So that's what we're gonna talk about now and we'll revisit this question. So we just saw gradient descent. Stochastic gradient descent is uh, a definite upgrade on uh, gradient descent because, see, let's think about this objective function, okay? I want to take the gradient of this function with respect to W. Forget the actual details of the function, um, wait, hold on. There's a, the coefficient half is not a hyperparameter. No, I, I said R, R. So, so the, the, let's take a look at this function here. Um, uh, if just, uh, the, uh, if you squint at it, really, it looks like a big summation over the data points of something. That something could be, uh, you know, this expression here. We want to compute the gradient of this with respect to the loss, with respect to the weights, sorry. When we compute the gradient of this with respect to the weights, this is really equal to the sum over the, of whatever is inside us. And that's uh, technically it's easy, but there's a fundamental problem. In order to compute one gradient, just to make one update to the weights, you need to sum over the entire data set. So imagine that you have a data set with a million examples to literally make the first update 
from W0 to W1, you need to sum over the entire uh, set of examples. But that may seem like a totally uh, a wasted opportunity because maybe after seeing 10 examples or maybe after seeing even one example, you could probably guess that the weights that you have are really bad and make an update. So why do you have to sum over the entire data set just to make one update when we can make these early updates? This is the intuition that uh, motivates stochastic gradient descent. And uh, a stochastic gradient descent algorithm may look something like this. And um, I'm writing this here again in the context of training. SGD, stochastic gradient descent, is a much more general algorithm that traces, traces its roots back to the 1950s. Uh, if you're interested, look up uh, Robbins Monroe. Uh, maybe there's an E at the end. Um, so the, the way it looks is uh, the, something like this. You have a training set, um, uh, XI, YI, and you have a, a weight vector that you want to learn. Xi and the weights are both um, uh, vectors in D dimensions because we are dealing with linear classifiers, but we'll very quickly drop that assumption when we go to neural networks. And uh, uh, your labels are minus one or one. Learning now proceeds in epochs. For every epoch, you pick a random example, Xi comma Yi. You pick a random example from the training set, and then you pretend that this random example that you just chosen is an entire data set. This is the entire data set that we have. Uh, we don't have all these uh, many, many examples. We just have one example. If you have only one example, we can still pretend that we want to write down the objective function with that one example, just that the summation will vanish. The summation will be just one example. Now we can call that objective j hat um, and compute its gradient at uh, the current weights, W T minus one. I don't know why I have T minus one here. Okay, W T minus one, as long as I'm consistent, it's okay. So I can pretend that the J of W, uh, I can pretend that X I Y I is my entire data set and write down this objective. And uh, there should be no min here. Um, I, I see that uh, there's a consistent mistake I have in the slides. Uh, one of my TAs, I hope to remind me to fix it this min should not exist. J of W is just the function. We want to find the minimum value of J of W. So uh, we can pretend that this is the entire data set. We can take its gradient with respect to the weights that we currently have and then make an update. So WT becomes WT minus one plus, uh, this is J hat, uh, gamma, I'm, I'm calling the learning rate gamma T times the current gradient that we just calculated with respect to just this one example. And then after this, that ends the epoch, uh, well, uh, then you uh, pick a new random example and you repeat the process. At every point, hopefully, maybe, you pick a different random example. As a result, you get different gradient steps. This algorithm, notice that it, uh, the, there are a few mistakes here. I'll fix the slides uh, uh, after class. But uh, the general intuition is you pick one example, you pretend that this is your entire training set, create an objective value for that one example, objective function for that one example, take the gradient of that and update. And then you toss out that example that you just picked, put it back into the bag of example, draw another example again, um, repeat the process. You keep doing this um, for T steps or maybe even forever. Now, this seems uh, kind of uh, interesting because first of all, we are making fast updates. We are making updates to the weights without having to go through the entire um, exam, uh, set of things. The second uh, interesting thing is the form of the stochastic gradient descent I have presented here is essentially the form that is formally analyzed. And uh, I think there's a comment about uh, replacement or something. This is the form where you take an example, you put it back in the bucket, you keep drawing with replacement, and this is the form that has formal analysis, but this won't be the version that we will actually be implementing. Um, there are, a, now let me revisit the question from Ryan. The stochastic gradient descent refer to randomly selecting the initial point. Um, actually, uh, not quite. It refers to the stochasticity is randomly selecting 
uh, examples. So it turns out that the objective function that we have here, uh, the SVM objective function has only one minimum because it's a convex function. There's only the, 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 the local minimum that we will reach is the global minimum. So multiple starting points are not necessary. In fact, because we have a convex objective, it doesn't matter where we start, we will always end up in the same, because the function is shaped like a bowl. Uh, we'll always end up in the same ob ob uh, objective value. This is a, a different, uh, th th this is a rather special thing. We have that for uh, SVM, so we will see that for uh, logistic regression, we will see that we, we will see that we actually had it also for, uh, for perceptron, but uh, the, the notion that we, the, we have a convex function to optimize is rather special. It's not going to always be the case. So uh, because we have a convex function, where we initialize doesn't matter. And that's why I said, let's initialize at zero. Um, so uh, the, the other comment is uh, it has to do something with making the gradient nicer. Well, yes and no, as we just saw. Um, so uh, the, the other question is, uh, we do not have a R here. Instead, we have a term with subscript T and the learning rate is changing with every epoch. Yeah, that's right. The learning rate is going to change. In fact, in fact, we will. it turns out that there's an entire cottage industry around picking learning rates. Different ways of choosing learning rates actually have uh, inside the scheme have different names for the, you get different named algorithms. Uh, and you know, playing with the learning rate is uh, a big part of uh, how quickly or how slowly learning uh, converges. Uh, here, I've just abstracted it out. Um, I get the impression, uh, there's a comment, I get the impression that uh, since training is over one example per epoch, we'll need a large number of epochs. Yes, in this case, we will need a large number of epochs. In fact, that's a good uh, 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 segue. This algorithm is actually guaranteed to converge to the minimum of J provided gamma T is small enough. And we, there's a formal uh, criterion here, we'll visit that later, but it's guaranteed to converge in expectation. What that means is if you run this to infinity, you'll get to the minimum. Uh, we don't have that much time, so we'll run into uh, uh, a long enough period till we are happy. Uh, as I said, this is not the version that we'll implement. Instead, we will actually uh, 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 see a minor tweak of it, which is uh, uh, kind of more manageable, so to speak. But this is the general uh, schema for uh, stochastic gradient descent. If you want to think about what how stochastic gradient descent compares with gradient descent, if you have a, a, a level curves of this kind, um, this is a, a topographical or a topological. I always confuse those two words. These are level curves, and imagine that we are uh, climbing down into a valley. What gradient descent does is it uh, if your if the function is uh, uh, has some uh, nice properties, it will. Uh, essentially make a straight line or smoothly go down to the uh, minimum. So it'll just go down this way. What stochastic gradient descent does, on the other hand, is the following. So in stochastic gradient descent, you start at some point and the gradient points not necessarily towards the minimum, but because you're picking one of the random elements of the summation, maybe it points in that direction. So you take a step there and then you take another step. Sometimes it might even take you the wrong way. You keep taking a step. Um, and the guarantee that we get is over time, in expectation, you will all you will get to a better uh, uh, point in the objective land here. Uh, it may take, as uh, the comment points out, uh, it may take many many more updates than gradient descent, but every individual update is computationally much less expensive. And in fact, uh, there's theory to show that for functions of this kind that we are looking at with uh, SVMs, this process in aggregate, the total number of gradient plus update steps is going to be less than the, what you do with uh, gradient descent. So it's, uh, it's computationally much more efficient because even though gradient descent may have taken fewer steps, each step is 
expensive because you have to sum over all the examples. Whereas here, each point is just one example. So the total number of uh, steps may be large, but the total number of gradient, uh, you know, the, the, the total computation that you spend is much, much less. Okay, uh, before we uh, we go back to SVM. Are there any questions? So since uh, stochastic gradient descent processes one example at a time, does this mean we can make it an online algorithm? Yes, almost. Um, it, the, technically speaking, it's not online because um, we don't. So if you look at this, we don't. Uh, once we see the example, once we use it, we don't toss it out. It goes back into the pile of examples and the next time you might actually choose the same random example again. So uh, it's not quite online, but uh, it gives you uh, the ideas around stochastic gradient descent uh, have been used for online, uh, ha have some close connections to online learning. Um, so if, instead of tossing the example back, if, uh, you don't get to control which example comes in and uh, you can kind of uh, take incremental uh, updates based on each example, you get a template for something that looks like non-line algorithm. So yes, there is some connection there. Um, are there any questions about uh, this? How do we choose gamma t? Gamma t is the step size. We'll talk about how to choose it afterwards. Are there any questions about uh, the, uh, the intuition for stochastic gradient descent? The, this is an important algorithm. Stochastic uh, gradient descent is the workhorse of modern machine learning. Uh, you may have heard of backpropagation, which we will see uh, a few weeks from now. Um, it's meant it, it, uh, the, the, it's meant to be used in the context of something like stochastic gradient descent. Stochastic gradient descent is an easy algorithm to implement, turns out, and uh, it uh, fairly robust optimizer. So there are a couple of questions. Um, uh, the upside down triangle is the gradient. This is the Greek. I don't know if it's Greek. This is Nabla. And it stands for gradient. Yes. Um, does it converge any faster than other varieties of gradient descent? In fact, it does. It uh, converges faster um, for if your function uh, satisfies certain properties. In particular, if your function looks like a big summation and the size of the summation is really large, you're better off using uh, stochastic gradient descent, provided you don't really, really care about the exact optimum and you're okay if you get to within a certain, within the, uh, to the neighborhood. Because remember, um, or notice that, uh, you may be wandering around this neighborhood, but uh, you won't maybe necessarily get exactly to the point here. Uh, do you have any example plots of J so that we know what it looks like? Unfortunately not, because J remember is a function that goes from R D, uh, which is a, a D dimensional space to a real number. Even with one, even if you have say two weights, if your weight vector is just, if you, uh, W is in R2, which is really you have W1 and W2, uh, J uh, takes this to a real number. So I, I, it, it becomes painful to plot. So I, I actually don't know how to plot the objective function here. We talked about stochastic gradient descent earlier when we were talking about perceptron. Uh, is this the same technique we're talking about now? In fact, it was not in the context of perceptron. We talked about stochastic gradient descent in the context of uh, least squares regression. Least mean squares. It's exactly the same stochastic gradient descent. In fact, stochastic gradient descent is uh, uh, is is like a, a schema. It's a meta algorithm that does not care about what this uh, function looks like. It applies for any of these provided that function is a big summation. So yeah, it's essentially the same technique. We are going into a lot more detail now. Okay, so let's uh, let's now talk about how this uh, can be instantiated in the context of SVM. So we have this whole thing where we treat the 
entire, uh, we pick a random example um, and pretend that it's a full data set and take the derivative of the SVM objective at the current point. And the SVM objective looks something like this. Once again, uh, there's a, this min should not exist here. The SVM objective looks something like that. And with if you have a only one example, then the only thing that's lost is this summation. We still have something else that is uh, the that it looks complicated enough. So really, uh, it's a function that looks like this, and this presents a problem. The hinge is not differentiable. The hinge loss, remember, is a function uh, that looks something like this. It's clearly this part is differentiable. This part is differentiable, but uh, at this point, there's a problem. It's uh, it's continuous. That's good, but it's not differentiable. So how do we take the derivative of the hinge loss? And we uh, you know we need to take the derivative of this function. How do we take the derivative of this function with respect to w? How do we differentiate? a function that looks like this. This is a function that looks like max of zero comma something, x. If f of x is this, how do you take the uh, derivative? How do you differentiate this function? Turns out you can't in general because you have a non-differentiable point. But we can uh, extend our definition of derivatives to something called sub gradients. It's a generalization of gradients to functions that are not differentiable in only a finite number of points. Um, uh, so there are, uh, so, um, oh, there, there's a comment. On one hand, are we particularly concerned where, where that we are, I think on the right side of the corner? Um, yeah, we specifically want to be on this side, yes. But uh, in order to do that, you know, once it hits this point, the optimization might, you know, just literally gradients don't exist. How do we deal with that? So we need something called subgradients, and subgradients are uh, an idea that uh, maybe not all of you have seen before. So let me uh, uh, introduce it in a sort of a loose way with uh, um, with an intuition. So remember, we talked about gradients, right? The gradient is really the, the it's, it corresponds to this, uh, uh, this tangent here. Uh, that's a hyperplane that lies below the function for all convex functions. We can generalize this to something called, instead of a tangent, we can generalize this to um, uh, something called a subtangent. A subtangent at any point is any hyperplane that lies below the function at that point and touches the function at that point. So when I say below, that means that this line never intersects the function in the immediate neighborhood. Um, so the subtangent sub is a generalization of tangent. It turns out that in this, for this particular function here that I've, I'm showing here, there's only one subtangent because there's only one line that lies below the function and touches the function at this point. So the subtangent is the tangent, but uh, we can uh, go beyond that. The subgradient is just the slope of that line. Let's look at an example. So uh, let's say we have this function here. This is an example from uh, Stephen Boyd's notes. Uh, uh, if you want to learn more about this, uh, look up uh, Stephen Boyd's book, it's fantastic. So. If you, uh, let's say you have this function here, this function here is differentiable at every point except at this one point here. Formally, we define a vector G to be a subgradient to this function if at any point F of, at any po uh, point, um, sorry, it's a subgradient at a point X if for any Y, F of Y, which is the value here, is more than f of x plus g transpose uh, y minus x. So if you have a point y here, this here is f of y, and this is where the line that lies below the function 
intersects with uh, this y thing. Uh, it, it's the value that uh, the line takes. So at every tangent line lies below or equal to. So let's uh, look at what, what this definition means. At this point x1, x1 is a point where this, uh, this function here is uh, differentiable. What that means is it's differentiable as a result at points that it's differentiable, the, the uh, tangent is the subtangent. In other words, if you have a tangent line, you have this line that looks like f of x, uh, the tangent plane really is f of x plus g transpose x minus x1. And g1 here is the tangent um, at this point. This is not, uh, sorry, g1 is the gradient. This is not a particularly interesting case. This is at this point, at x1, the function behaves like any differentiable function. So it, this is just to show that this definition applies there. Let's consider this other point. At this other point, x2, it's really uh, the, uh, this, the way this is defined is it's not differentiable. So you have these uh, two sides that intersect with each other in a non-differentiable way. If you are coming from this side, you have a line that is tangential to that point, to the, the, to the function on this side. If you're coming from this side, you have a line that's tangential here. And the nice thing is both these lines, and in fact, every line, even a line in between, satisfies the property that it lies fully below the function. So you have these two lines f1, sorry, uh, f of x2 plus g2 transpose x minus x2 and f of x2 plus g3 transpose x minus x2. And both these uh, lines are below the function and they start, this is the equation of the line. The line is always below the function value. The definition of a subgradient is that both g2 and g3 are subgradients. In fact, even the blue line, which does not have an equation, but uh, it lies in between these two, that also is a subgradient. So the subgradient at a point is a set of uh, 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 things that uh, set of uh, slopes of lines, all of which lie below the point. Why is this interesting? Now, the reason subgradients are interesting is because, oh, uh, let's just uh, wrap up the point about subgradients because the specific function we care about is max. We have a function that looks like max of zero and some z. So it may look something like this. This specific function is uh, the problem case is exactly this one point here. So applying that intuition, if we are coming from this side, this line itself is tangential. If we are coming from this side, this line is tangential. So the gradient of both this one and this one are subgradients of uh, uh, the line uh, of max. In other words, if you are on this, let me just uh, uh, give you a better example. Let's say you have max. Sorry, suppose you have max of uh, x square and x minus one square, something like this. So you have, this would be x square, and x minus one square is just the shifted version of this, so it could be something like this. Um, maybe I just didn't draw this right. Let me not draw, uh, um, let me not draw pictures, let me just uh, describe what it means. So we have this, uh, this function here, Oh, I know what's going on. These two things don't intersect. So suppose you have a function max of f of x and g of x in general. What you do is given a point x, first find, are you in the f of x side? So the max might be something like it's uh, you're taking, this could be f and this could be g. Given a point, or if at this point, the value of the function is really defined by G. At this point, the value is defined by F. At this point, they are equal. So it doesn't matter which one you pick. So first find where uh, X uh, lies. So does it lie on the G side or the F side? So in other words, you solve the max. Um, so then 
if you lie on the G side, you just use the gradient of this function. If you lie on the F side, you use the gradient of this function. If you lie at the midpoint, just pick one, it doesn't matter. So then, so first you solve them, solve for the max. And two, get gradient. So this will either give you F or G because only one of those will apply of uh, the, that case. Let me give you a concrete example here. So suppose you have this particular function, max of uh, zero comma one minus y w transpose x. If this quantity um, is bigger, then you the, the entire function j becomes half w transpose w plus c times one minus y w transpose x. Otherwise, it just becomes half w transpose w. If uh, in this is when y, y w transpose x is greater than or equal to one, this is else. Now, if this happens, the subgradient is defined to be, so notice that both these sides are just differentiable functions. So what you do is if y w transpose x is more than one, the gradient of j is simply the gradient of that quantity, which is just w. Otherwise, the gradient of j is the derivative of this quantity. So you have the, de uh, the derivative of, let me write this more cleanly because I see that I'm going upside down in the page. So j of w is defined to be half w transpose w plus c times max zero comma one minus y w transpose x. So first given uh, for a particular x and y, you have, I can rewrite j of w is one of two things. Either it's half w transpose w or it's half w transpose w plus c times one minus y w transpose x. That's, I've just written the max in a different way. The first case is when y, when one minus, if y, one minus y w transpose x is negative. And this is else, this is j. Now I can take the gradient of each side. The gradient of j with respect to uh, this thing is on the first case, I'm not going to write the definitions of the cases anymore. On the first case you have, just w. The second side, you have w plus, this is the, what's the derivative of a line? So c times minus yx. Why? Because uh, the derivative of this with respect to w is just w. The derivative of this with respect to w is defined entirely by this. w is just linear, so it's just yx. And that's what we have on this slide, except uh, with a lot, uh, at this point with a much cleaner way of writing it. So what we have here is a way to compute subgradients of the hinge loss. Now, why is this an interesting thing? Who said this makes sense? Um, it's possible that, uh, uh, you know, this is, uh, you know, the, we know that great subgradient descent, sorry, gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent takes us to the minimum. The reason stochastic subgradients are interesting is because stochastic subgradient descent also takes us to the minimum of a convex function. So essentially what it means is everything that I said with SGD, when I said gradients, you could have replaced it with subgradients and all the convergence properties come in and we have a nice way to compute gradients or subgradients of uh, the SVM objective. So let's uh, instantiate this in a little bit more detail. There's a question, um, the max function as long as we are uh, on the right side of the corner, is it particularly significant where the function lies? You know, in general, it's always better to make y w transpose x bigger, um, but it's not going to matter because when we are on, when y w transpose x is more than one, the loss vanishes. So as far as the objective function is concerned, it is blind to whether it is 1.1 1 
or a million because in both cases the loss is zero uh, this is an answer to ashton's question and yes uh, we will get something that looks a lot like perceptron so let's uh, actually look at that so we uh, are almost we have almost all the pieces that we need this is the gradient uh, the sub gradient so uh, so we are now going to build up stochastic sub gradient descent for svm we are given a training set consisting of pairs of examples xi and yi uh, and x the examples are d dimensional vectors we initialize the weights to some point you, you know in the, the d dimensional space it doesn't really matter where so let's just to make our lives easy and initialize to the zero vector and now learning proceeds in epochs earlier um what we did was i said pick a random example and make an update instead of picking a random example in practice what we do is uh, we actually cycle through all the examples so that every example gets a shot at uh, uh, providing information to the weights so we just iterate through every training example and you update the weights to be w minus uh, the gradient times uh, uh, the uh, minus the gradient but uh, the length of the update is controlled by the step size denoted by gamma t but we know what the uh, so let me uh, see we know what the gradient looks like so the gradient here um, looks something like uh, exactly this so then w becomes w minus either w or so oh there's a gamma so w minus gamma t times either w or w minus c y i x i this case happens when 1 minus y w transpose x is greater than 0 this case happens if 1 minus y w transpose x is less than 0 so really we have this check if this is greater than 0 then we have this update if otherwise we have this update so i can write this as uh, uh, something like this if y, y w transpose x is less than 1 then w is i just cleaned up everything and put everything together w is 1 minus gamma times w plus gamma c y i x i otherwise w is 1 minus gamma times w so um let's see uh is it preferable to shuffle the examples yes in fact uh, um it's absolutely preferable it's actually important to shuffle the examples at the start of each epoch uh the gradient does not depend on x when x is correctly predicted it seems like we don't need to update w this is a very good uh, observation on this side the gradient does not depend on x um and yet we are updating the w why is that this is a uh, specific this is uh, if the if y w transpose x was greater than 1 then there was the way, the weight vector was good there was no need to update the w but it turns out there is actually something that uh, uh, we can do if y w transpose x is uh, more than 1 so let's consider the case uh, when y w transpose x is greater than 1 the weight vector is correctly predicting the uh, example and in fact is putting the example far away from the uh, margin but by making this update what are we uh, uh, gaining consider the two uh, weights before and after the update what we end up doing is 1 minus gamma times w uh, gamma t times w we are, if gamma is a small number between 0 and 1 then this transpose 1 minus gamma t times w is really this is equal to 1 minus gamma t square w transpose w if gamma is a number between 0 and 1 this quantity is less than 1 which means we are reducing the norm of w by reducing the norm of w we are gaining generalization points remember we are reducing we are increasing the margin so what we, this this first term in both the updates essentially says we try to make the margin bigger the second one says we want to make the um the lo the loss smaller so even if an example is correctly classified we try to get make the margin a little bigger 
And that's why we have this update when the example is incorrectly classed, uh, even when the example is correctly classified. Why is the symbol for learning rate changing all the time? Earlier it was R, now it's gamma T. Uh, what can I say? Um, yeah, uh, it would. This it it probably would have made sense to have gamma all the way through. This this seems to emulate average perceptron. I don't see why, but there's an interesting connection. We'll talk about that very soon. Now, many of you ask questions about how do you uh, pick the learning rate. It turns out there are many many ways to pick the learning rate. Um, the, you know, you can just. Uh, 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 there are many heuristics. There are properties that they need to satisfy. But really, what this say, uh, what, what we know from the theory here is that if the learning rate is small enough, um, uh, with enough iterations, this will converge in expectation. With high probability, it will converge. Uh, but this means, um, uh, but, but concretely, the, the property that is needed for the learning rate of the step size is uh, they need to be square summable, but not summable. What that means is, the step sizes gamma t should all be positive. The sum of gamma t square, where t is uh, say zero to infinity, is should be a finite number, the sum of the squares, but the sum of this thing from of gamma t itself should, con uh, should or let's just write it this way. Uh, this, the sum of the step sizes, should go towards infinity. There are, as long as we get these properties are satisfied, then with enough iterations, this will converge. Now we don't need to worry too much about that because uh, there are many functions, many learning rate strategy, uh, decaying strategies that satisfy. What you use for your perceptron homework actually satisfies that, uh, where gamma t is gamma zero divided by one plus t. You could use some other thing that looks like this, which also is a scaled version of that. And there are other versions. Uh, what can we say about the convergence of this thing? It turns out for, uh, if you have N examples that are D-dimensional, gradient descent uh, takes, uh, we can ask how many iterations do we need to get within an accuracy epsilon? Gradient descent takes N order of ND log one over epsilon steps, whereas stochastic gradient descent just takes D over epsilon. What does this mean? Gradient descent, the number of steps needed, depends on the number of examples you have. In stochastic gradient descent, with some minor caveats, but uh, not too many, the number of, uh, in order to get within epsilon, the number of examples doesn't seem to matter. This, uh, if you want to see the proof, uh, look up uh, this paper called Pegasus uh, that goes through the proof uh, from 2008 or something like that, or seven which is cool because the, the, we can get to within epsilon of uh, the best uh, of the optimum without in time that is not dependent on the number of examples. There are more soft subtleties here, but in general, stochastic gradient descent is the preferred thing that uh, uh, when the data set is uh, huge. Um, there are many, many, many variants uh, based on this general strategy. Um, so you may have heard of uh, um, phrases like, um, uh, or names like Adam, uh, which is an Adam optimizer or uh, Adagrad, which uh, adaptive uh, learning rate uh, um, uh, for each feature, for it, that's what it gets you. Momentum is a way of making this process a little smoother. We'll probably see momentum and Adagrad a little later. Um, and then there are many, many different variants of these things. So this is a general strategy of stochastic gradient descent, but uh, instantiating the actual updates and the learning rates uh, has, there's, it's a constantly growing field. Um, in maybe uh, the three minutes that are left, okay, there's a question. If we keep getting correct, correct predictions, eventually W will go to zero. How does that maximize the margin? When W is zero, the margin, remember, is inverse. Uh, it depends on one over the norm of, is proportional to one over the norm of W. So that gives you infinite, um, margin. So when the weight vector is zero, your margin is effectively infinite. So if we keep getting correct predictions, then life is good because that means you have a linearly separable data set. So uh, let's uh, now uh, go back to a question that came up. That's, uh, I think uh, a few of you noticed that what we saw now looks a lot like perceptron. So the update that we had looks something like this. 
Um, for every tiny example, if y w transpose x is less than one, then you say you shrink w by multiplying it with one minus gamma, and then you add uh, a constant times uh, y x. Otherwise, you just shrink the w. In perceptron, what you do is instead of checking with one, you check if y w transpose x is negative. And if so, you just add a scaled version of the example, which looks a bit like this. The extra that's there in SVM is irrespective of whether you make an update or not, you shrink the weight. And the comparison is uh, now not with respect to zero, but with respect to one. So there is, this must remind you uh, from homework one, we saw margin perceptron. Uh, my pen is not really uh, working too well, so let's, it turns out that this similarity is not accidental. In fact, just like we saw the hinge loss for SVM uh, with regularization, the perceptron algorithm can be entirely rederived, and this is an exercise for you, using what is called the perceptron loss. The perceptron loss is this function that assigns a penalty to each example, which uh, is either zero or minus y w transpose x. So it's not one minus y w transpose x, it's just minus y w transpose x. And importantly, there's no regularization. So the perceptron is, can be seen, uh, the batch version of the perceptron can be seen as an unregularized perceptron loss optimization problem. And the way you solve it is once again, you apply stochastic subgradient descent for this loss function. So the perceptron and SVM are really, really close cousins. There's no regularization in perceptron. So, uh, and then the, the loss function is the perceptron loss. What is interesting is how on earth does perceptron get generalization? Because remember, regularization is for, my, uh, for improving generalization. The way we get generalization into perceptron is not through regularization, but in a procedural way using averaging. So the role that uh, the regularizer plays for SVM is served by, uh, uh, is performed by the averaging process. There's a procedural regular, regularization. So these two things are very close. And I'll leave this as an exercise to uh, write down the perceptron loss for a data set and apply derived stochastic subgradient descent to come up with the perceptron algorithm. Let me wrap up the SVM unit. This is the last thing and uh, we'll stop after this. SVMs involve uh, uh, minimizing regularized hinge loss. Uh, from an optimization point of view, you can solve this using stochastic subgradient descent. It's really fast because the runtime does not depend, uh, well, it's, uh, at least in theory, does not depend on the number of examples. It's worth mentally comparing this with the perceptron algorithm. The perceptron uh, does not maximize the width of the margin, though you can introduce margin through something like the margin perceptron. Uh, you need to think about how you decide on uh, convergence. Uh, if you, uh, uh, we spoke about this a little bit. So you want to, uh, uh, you know, how many steps do you run is actually something that uh, it becomes a hyperparameter. Stochastic subgradient descent is not the only way in which SVMs are optimized. There are other successful strategies. One example is uh, this notion called coordinate descent in the dual. We won't talk about this, but uh, this is implemented inside um, uh, the liblinear library that uh, um, that powers, say, for example, the SVM inside scikit-learn. Um, so I'll stop here. Um, I'll pause for questions. If you don't have questions, feel free to leave, and I'll just be answering questions for a minute or two. Um, we will have office on office hours on Tuesday. There won't be any office. There won't be any class on Tuesday. I will be around if you want uh, to chat for office hours. Um, feel free to leave if you want, and uh, I'll answer the last couple of questions and then wrap up. So there's a question that says, uh, what does regularization look like graphically with respect to the threshold function? Um, I don't understand what that means. Uh, maybe uh, we can take that question to office hours uh, because I really have a, I, I don't quite get what you're getting, what you mean there. Okay, um, I'm going to stop. Um, and uh, remember, no class next Tuesday, so I'll see you all on Thursday. And uh, uh, in the meanwhile, don't forget your homework.